great words. Please take your seats. And as we continue in our Dare to Believe series, we come to Hezekiah. And I want you to imagine the scene that Darren just read to us. A king, an 8th century BC king, who is in a shrinking kingdom, pressed on each side, uh, receives a letter. And as he looks at it, he sees the seal, he recognizes the seal, he knows what it's going to say. But still he opens it, and as he tears it open, he recognizes the message inside. And as he takes it out, he feels sick, his, his heart is in his throat, and he opens it up, and he, he reads the message. And as he reads each page, he's, he's shaking with fear because he understands what it means for him and for his kingdom. And so he does the only thing he can think to do. His options are run out. He, he goes to the temple, and he, he bends down, and he spreads it out in front of God on the floor. And there in this incredibly physical, incredibly real moment, a king bows and prays for salvation. It's an incredible image, isn't it? And to understand it and to get inside it and to make sense of what happens there in that moment, I think we need to look a bit closer at the man and understand a bit more of what the story is all about. We need to take things back a little bit. So, so understand with me for a moment who, who Hezekiah is. If you've got a Bible open in, in front of you, then that will really help you this evening because we're going to jump around a couple of chapters in two kings. Hezekiah was a good king. Um, when you read through the letter of two, uh, sorry, the, the book of two kings, you find that it's a, it's a patchy bunch of kings. Actually, our whole series, Dare to Believe, is, is full of all kinds of flawed characters. And Hezekiah was flawed. He was no, by no means perfect. But, but compared to some of his contemporaries, he was a good king. Uh, you might know that there's a refrain that comes up often in the books of, of Kings and in Chronicles as well. It says that often these kings did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and more often than not, they did. But, but what do we read about Hezekiah? Look at chapter 18, verse 3. Chapter 18, verse 3 says this. 2 Kings 18, verse 3 says, Hezekiah, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. That's pretty good, but it goes on, more than it says about some, just as his father David had done. You know, if you know anything about the history of the um, Old Testament kings in Israel, the one to be like was David. He was the one to, to chase after and to emulate. That was him. And Hezekiah had done that. Hezekiah was a good king. He, he had got rid of all the, the, the idol worship that used to happen. Uh, there were these things called Asherah poles, and there were sacred stones, and, and even some of the things that God had given to his people um, to impart grace to them. This, this um, bronze snake had been turned and distorted into something uh, that was made an object of worship rather than God himself. It's, it's a, it shows what the human heart is like. But Hezekiah smashes all this stuff up. Hezekiah follows the law of Moses. He does what he's supposed to do. He's a good king. But why do we find him in this position before God in chapter 19, in the temple, face down, tears, you imagine, staining his face, praying that God would rescue them? How does it get to this point? Well, to understand that, we need to turn the clock back about a decade and understand how this all came to pass. You see, about 10 years before all of this, Hezekiah was a relatively young king. He was, he was still in his late 20s. And a shocking, an earth-shattering event happened just up the road from him in the northern kingdom. You see, at this point in, in Israel's history, there were, there were two parts of, of God's nation, Israel. It had split in two after King Solomon. There was the north called Israel with its capital, Samaria. And there was the south called Judah with its capital, Jerusalem. And after years and years of rebellion, the Assyrian superpower had swept in and utterly decimated the north. It was literally wiped off the map forever, and any survivors were repopulated or re resettled in other parts of, of the world. That nation, as far as anyone's concerned, was gone, done with, destroyed. As you can imagine, Hezekiah, this young, inexperienced king, four years under his belt, only 29, looking up the road at what had just happened in Israel, knowing that they were next on the hit list from the Assyrian Empire. You imagine maybe what it would have been like for those in the Second World War as, as France was occupied and you saw the, the Nazi force sweeping across Europe. You knew that the next stop was across the Channel. And the same thing was probably going through Hezekiah's mind, except there wasn't um, a body of water in between him and um, uh, the Assyrian army. And so Hezekiah is living with this kind of pressure, increasing day by day, week and month by month, year by year, over the course of about a decade. 
and all the time, uh, the Assyrian kings are pressing in on him and his kingdom until one day he gets a message. One day, uh, King Sennacherib sends some of his officers, and they have very grand titles, the commander, um, sorry, with the large army, sorry, uh, where are they? Ah, chief officer, there you go. And, and some of his guys uh, come to, to meet with um, Hezekiah's officials and, and to share a message with them. So now we're looking, we're going to go in a bit more detail in chapter 18 from verse 17. And here in this little section here where it says that Sennacherib threatened um, Jerusalem, uh, we hear the words of his officials. And it's interesting, actually, context is everything in the Bible, where they meet. They, they meet in a, a place that seems fairly unassuming, the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. And most of us probably don't know what happened there. But if you go back a generation, Hezekiah's father, Ahaz, who was possibly one of the worst kings that the nation ever had, had a choice to make at the washerman's field. The decision was, who will you trust? When they were hard-pressed, would they put their trust in God, or would they make an alliance with the empire of Assyria? And Ahaz made the wrong choice. And so almost as though history is repeating itself now, a generation on, Hezekiah's officials are there, listening to the officials from Sennacherib, the, the new king of Assyria. And what will Hezekiah do? What will the son do? Will he follow his father? We'll, we'll see what happens. Anyway, some slightly less impressive um, officials from Israel come to join the officials from Assyria. In verse 18, you see they're called, um, they called for the king. And Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, sounds relatively important, uh, Shebna, the secretary, and Asaph, the recorder. <laughs> he takes the minutes for this whole meeting. Um, these guys come down to the washerman's field to hear what they have to say. And, and, and what does the field commander say? Look at verse 19. This is what the great king, the king of Assyria says. On what are you basing your confidence? You say you have counsel and the might for war, but you speak only empty words. And here's the key bit. This is the, the, the heart to understanding these few chapters. On whom are you depending? On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? And that's really going to be the heart of the, the story of Hezekiah here. In whom does he trust? On whom does he depend? That's what sets Hezekiah apart, perhaps, from some of the other kings in, in the history of Israel. Anyway, they've come to lay down the law. They, they've come to try and kick these guys out of their land. Because actually, Jerusalem was a tricky place to besiege. It wasn't an easy place to attack. And so it would be far easier if they could intimidate them into surrender. Remember, Assyria is a big army. We know from the records here in the Bible, they had at least 150,000 fighting men. Uh, the army of Judah at this point was probably about 2,000 men. So there's a huge disparity in the size of their, their military force. Uh, really, Judah doesn't stand a chance. And so he goes on, this, this commander, to, to challenge him a little bit. He says, who are you, who are you, uh, who are you looking to, to to defend you? Why are you rebelling against us? Is it Egypt? We know you like to, to go to Egypt when you're in trouble, and they would be the, the neighbors to the west. And if you're getting attacked from the east, go to the west and see if they'll help you out. Uh, but he says, you know, it's just like a, a stick that if you lean on it, it's going to spike you in your hand and give you splinters. It's not going to help you out. But, but he, he imagines that perhaps there's some people there um, in this scene. This is at Jerusalem with the soldiers across the walls. There's, there's some there who maybe are a bit more pious and they're trusting in God. Well, what does he say? Look at verse 25 with me. Uh, this, this commander from the Assyrian army says, Furthermore, I have come to attack and to, have I come to attack and destroy this place without a word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. He has the boldness to say, your God says that I'm on his side and he sent me to come and beat you up and destroy you and kick you out. Now, now I imagine lots of them a while ago wouldn't have believed this, but remember, just, just 10 years before this, uh, their neighbors to the north have been kicked out and destroyed uh, by the Assyrian Empire. Perhaps it feels a bit more believable today than it did a few years before. And so they, they build up the rhetoric as they go along. We're going to come and get you. You better surrender now because it's only going to get worse for you. And look at verse 26. There's no surprise uh, that they do this because this is really psychological warfare in its earliest form. Uh, then Elikiah, um, sorry, Elikim, son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah, uh, and Joah said to the field commander, please speak to your servants in Aramaic since we understand it. 
Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. In other words, be quiet. <laughs> Keep it down. This is not good for morale. You coming here and flashing your swords and, and shouting at us, uh, that's not going to help anybody. So what do they do? Do they say, okay, yeah, let's go and talk in private. Let's, let's kind of have some diplomacy here. No, they don't do that. Look at verse 27. But the commander replied, it was only, was, sorry, was it only to your master and to you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the people sitting on the wall who, like you, listen to this, will have to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine. He, he's painting a vile picture for them of what a besieged city is like. They would know what this was like because they'd seen it happen up the road just a few years previous. They would know what it's like when a mighty empire like this surrounds the city and cuts off all supplies, when there's no water, when there's no food, when there's no medical support. And you can imagine, it was a lot like what we see today in the news when we look at cities like Aleppo. We see the horror of a besieged city. And they would have understood that they would have known what that was like. And they appeal to that. And they say it as loudly as they can. And they say it in Hebrew so everyone can understand. What are they trying to do? They just want to intimidate and frighten the soldiers. It's not good for morale with the troops. And it's interesting what else he says here as well as he builds his case. You see, they'd love for them to surrender. Look at verse 31. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me. And come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern. By the way, cistern is like a, a well. It's not the thing on the back of the toilet. Um, until I come and take your, uh, you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive oil and honey. Choose life, not death. Who does he sound like? Anyone? He sounds like God, doesn't he? God offers them a land flowing with, with milk and honey. God offers them a land with vineyards, a land of freedom, a land of abundant harvest. And God, I, I doubt that they realize this, but they're quoting God from Deuteronomy. Several times in that book, God says to the people before they're about to enter the land, choose life, not death. And here, almost setting himself up as a God to them, he says, choose me and choose life. Trust me. And here's that question that we was raised at the beginning. Who are you trusting? Who are you resting in? And so for Hezekiah and for his officials here and for the, the people of Israel, the question was hanging there, waiting to be answered. Who are they going to trust? Who are they going to trust? I think we see this in modern day Syria and Iraq, don't we? I mean, it's, it's incredibly... It's, it's a modern retelling of this same story, isn't it? When a Christian is told, renounce your faith, turn to Islam, or we'll behead you. I heard a priest on the, on the radio this morning from Syria, and he was telling exactly that same story. He'd been held hostage for a number of months by Islamic State, and he was told almost every day, renounce your faith, turn your back on Christianity, and turn to Islam, and we won't kill you. And it's the same thing here, but eight centuries BC, that God's people are told, renounce your God, turn to us and live. Now, I don't think any of us here in the West experience anything quite like that. There's nothing comparable to what is going on here or to what some of our brothers and sisters are experiencing in different parts of the world, but, but this is reality for them. And I think sometimes we listen to sermons that are immediately applicable. It's a sermon about our thought life or a sermon about what we look at on YouTube. I did one of them this morning. But, but other times we listen to sermons, not because maybe it's happening to us right now, but because maybe one day it will. And we need to hear these things now to be prepared. Sometimes you hear a very good sermon on grief when you're not grieving, but you'll be thankful that you did when grief comes your way. Sometimes you'll hear a good sermon on what to do when your health takes a turn for the worst. And at the moment, you're fit as a fiddle, but one day that sermon will do you a lot of good. And this evening really is a sermon about being persecuted. And yes, yeah, sometimes we have a hard time as Christians in, in the UK, but I don't think we can really say we're persecuted. But who knows what will happen within a generation? Who knows what sort of things we'll be uh, pressed with um, as time goes on? And these are the messages we need to hear, even now when life is pretty comfortable for us as Christians. Anyway, hearing this message, Hezekiah 
is completely overwhelmed, and, and he goes to a man who he thinks might be able to help him, a man called Isaiah. You probably know Isaiah from his book. He's, a, he's a, a, he, One of the books of uh, prophecy in the Old Testament is written um, from him, about him, um, his, his teachings. And he goes to Isaiah, and Isaiah reassures him. He says, God isn't going to let you down. God is going to come through for you. But then again, in the lead up to what we saw at the beginning, this man on his knees before God, um, Hezekiah is confronted again by the king of Assyria. Again, the king of Assyria comes to him, and look at what he says to him in verse 10. Say to, sorry, this is verse 19, chapter 19, verse 10. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says, Jerusalem will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Surely, you have heard what the king of Assyria have, uh, kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my predecessors deliver them? The gods of Gozan, Haran, Rezef, and the people of Eden, who were in Tel Asar? Where is the king of Hamath or the king of Arpat? Where are the kings of Lair, Sephavain? Hena and Iva. You get the point, don't you? Every single one of them was failed by their gods. None of them could stand up to me. None of them could take the Assyrian Empire. No one could pose a threat to them. Every single one of them I trampled in my path. Do you want to be next? <laughs> and Hezekiah receives this letter, this message in the post. And this man is undone. You know, I was saying that his, his, his empire was shrinking. Uh, Sennacherib, in one of his own, you can, you can read um, Assyrian Chronicles and that kind of thing, and he, he describes King Hezekiah. Uh, this is outside of the Bible, kind of some of the Assyrian side of the, of the conflict. He describes him as a, a caged bird locked up in his capital city. And you see his, his, his capital, um, well, his kind of um, command, military command, is in Lachish. It's only 40, 50 miles from, from Jerusalem. He, he was so close. Uh, the nation was kind of falling apart. And Hezekiah is in his, in his city. Supplies are limited. His army is dwindling to nothing. What has he got left? He ha has only a few plays left in his hand. He's got nothing up his sleeve but to pray. And so he falls to his knees before God with no options available to him. I, I, think, I think of some of the, the Christians in, in Syria and Iraq at the moment. I mean, what, humanly speaking, can they do? Who, who can they appeal to? What authority can help them? There's nothing they can do but pray. And Hezekiah finds himself in exactly the same position with nothing up his sleeve, with no options, with nothing to fall back on. Strategy won't work, diplomacy won't work, military action won't work. None of this is going to help him now. He's a king who's going to see his nation consumed by this superpower unless God steps in. And, and so prayer is it. That's all he has up his sleeve. And I'm sure none of us here Probably none of us being monarchs have ever found ourselves in that position, but maybe, maybe you found yourself feeling like that, feeling like there's nothing left to do, there's, there's nothing that can make this right, there's nothing that can fix this situation. I, ju I just can't sort it out. Maybe you're in the depths of grief. Perhaps you're on the verge of redundancy. Maybe you're experiencing mental illness and, and it just feels like it consumes you and the darkness just hems you in. And you cannot see a way out of the situation. Well, Hezekiah finds himself in a place like that. And as he comes to pray, I just want us to read his prayer now and think a little bit about the way that he prays when all other options have been exhausted. Because I think it might help us as we find ourselves sometimes in these situations. So uh, join me uh, in, in reading along, well, follow along as I read in, in chapter 19, verse 14. It's what Darren read to us earlier. But let's read it again because... Hopefully we'll hear it again with, with a fresh appreciation for the spot that he was in. Um, chapter 19, verse 14. So Hezekiah receives the letter uh, from the messenger and read it. Then he went up to the temple and, uh, of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned before the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. 
You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord. The Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone, fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. It's a powerful prayer, isn't it? From a man who's got nothing left to give. And the first thing I think that we can notice from his prayer is that the posture of faith is prayer. And what I mean by that is you see what faith looks like when you see a person praying. Faith can feel like a very kind of vague, airy-fairy thing, can't it? People talk about faith, but, but what does it look like? And there's different ways you can see faith, but certainly in a man like this, on his knees, calling out to God, you see faith acted out. You see the reality of faith, a kind of visible, observable faith. You see here, for Hezekiah, there was nothing else he could trust in and no one else who could rescue him. And here he recognizes who God is. Do you see how he describes him? He describes him as the one who is God over all the kingdoms of the earth. He acknowledges that all the other gods, these gods that have been mentioned, I think there were 10 of them in the last few verses in that, that kind of showy um, letter that was sent to him from, um, from Sennacherib. 10 of those gods, but, but none of them were really gods. They were gods with a small g, gods that didn't really exist, gods that were just bits of stone or created things. And Hezekiah recognizes there is something distinct and unique about his God, that his God is the Lord, that his God is the creator, that his God is God, and that's really what he's trusting in. And how does he show that? Well, he shows that by praying. And I'm not talking about the kind of prayers that, that probably some of us will go in for from time to time. You know, we kind of say a prayer before bedtime or, or we pray with our children because it's kind of a habit we've got to. And it's a good thing to do. It's good to have kind of habits and to have rhythms to our day. We say grace before a meal or whatever. Those things are good. I'm not knocking them. But sometimes they can be quite um, mechanical. You turn the handle, you say the prayer, you move on to the next bit of the day. This kind of prayer that we see here is like a reflex it's like muscle memory. Something goes wrong for Hezekiah. And what is the first thing he does? Who's the first person he speaks to? It's God. His reaction to any crisis is to pray. Why? Well, because it, it reveals an inner kind of thinking in Hezekiah. Well, something's gone wrong. What can I do? Who can I go to? Who can help me? God can. It demonstrates his trust because he, he prays instinctively. He, he prays reflexively or re responsively to whatever comes his way. And so prayer is something that we, we should try to build into our life as a way of expressing our faith. If we really trust God, if we really believe that God is God, then it should be natural for us to pray when, when things come our way. Now, as I said, I doubt we're going to find ourselves in circumstances like these. We, we might find ourselves in, in tricky circumstances. Maybe, like I said, a problem with, with, with our job. I know in a church this size, there are people who are coping with bereavement in different ways at different times um, most of the time. And at hard times like that, where do we go? When things are, are agonizingly painful, who, who do we look to? Well, if we trust God as the one who heals, the one who comforts, the one who answers prayers, then the natural thing to do is to pray, isn't it? People of faith pray. It's the posture we, we take. The second thing I want us to see in this prayer is the way that he is motivated to pray. Do you see, there's a lot of things he could have prayed. I try to imagine how I might have prayed, and obviously you can't really put yourself realistically in his position. But I imagine I would have prayed that God would sort them out, that God would make things all right for me, that God would keep me safe and keep my family safe and provide enough food, and enough water, and the infrastructure we need and all that kind of stuff. I'd, I'd be praying prayers that, that sort things out for me, but he, he prays a very different kind of prayer. It has the same end. That's interesting. We'll come back to that in a second. But he prays for very different motives. It says in verse 19, Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hands. Why? so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. 
in this whole situation, the thing that bothers him most of all is that people will think that God isn't God. Hezekiah can't live with the reality that, that Sennacherib might think that Yahweh is like these other gods, that he's like the gods of Gozan or Haram or Rezef, and who's heard of them? Yeah? Hezekiah can't imagine anything worse than that, that God's glory is robbed from him, that God is not recognized as God, that if it's seen that God seems to not be keeping his covenant promises to his people, then God will doubt that God is really Lord, that he's really king of all the nations, king of all the earth. That's what Hezekiah is most concerned about. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with praying prayers for ourselves. I think God likes to hear when something is on our mind that we bring it to him in prayer, that we're very real in our prayers. If we're hurting, that we pray prayers about our hurt. If we long for something, that we pray prayers longing for whatever it is that we want. There's nothing wrong with that, but we'd hope that as we mature, we see things in a mature way like Hezekiah does that we see things with a wider lens than just ourselves, that we recognize that there are bigger implications than just our comfort. And Hezekiah sees that, doesn't he? As he prays this big, all-encompassing prayer, he, he longs that the nation will be delivered. He, he wants his people safe. He wants his family safe. He wants to be safe too. But above that, on top of that, he wants to see God glorified. He wants to see God honored. And so, I don't know, imagine, for example, you're in work and you get a hard time for being a Christian. People know you're a Christian and it's not easy. Um, at times it's really painful and you're tempted just to keep quiet about your faith. I think most of us have probably had situations like that from time to time. How would you pray about that? Well, it wouldn't be wrong to pray, God, just, just stop them from picking on me, stop them from being nasty, I don't like it, or kind of get me moved to a different department or a different desk. It's okay to pray those prayers. But perhaps as we go on praying, as God softens our heart, a bigger prayer is to say, God, change the situation. I, I can't live with the fact that they don't know you. I can't live with the fact that they don't recognize you for who you really are. Lord, show them through me, maybe through my perseverance, through their, their picking on me, that you are good, that you are God. Show them through my perseverance something of yourself. Lord, Lord, open their hearts, soften their hearts, save them. You know, that kind of prayer is bigger. That kind of prayer is God-centered, not just us-centered. And you see how one flows out of the other, and they're not in conflict with each other. But it's for a maturity of prayer. That's what we're looking for. Now, the final thing that I want us to think about here doesn't exactly come out of Hezekiah's prayer. In fact, this is maybe a bad example, because what happens here, well, some of us will know the story. Isaiah wades in, and we get a big bit from Isaiah here, saying that God isn't going to let his people down. That happens after the prayer. It's interesting. Isaiah knows that he's been praying and responds to it before he, he kind of even has heard about it or seen it. It's uh, amazing how God works. But Isaiah uh, foresees that God is going to keep his promises, that God isn't going to let his people go. And, and actually, what happens is, is remarkable. Um, Sennacherib withdraws his army through these circumstances. He goes back to his, his home city, and there he's assassinated. God deals with him because of the offense that he, he's kind of doled out to God, and God rescues his people. And this is really encouraging, and it's good to know this, because sometimes God answers prayers in, in dramatic and powerful ways like this. But the truth is that often God doesn't answer prayers in quite this way. And sometimes it takes a long time. Now, now to be fair, this took a while as well. Just think, it was about 10 years between uh, the northern kingdom being wiped off the, the map by Assyria and all these events happening and Sennacherib finally being dealt with by God. 10 years of being pressurized, 10 years of living in fear, 10 years of them breathing down his neck. So God doesn't always answer in the timing we expect, but sometimes God won't answer in the way we expect either. And so the question is, when God's timing is not what we want or what we'd hope for, how can we still trust him? And for this, I, I want to turn to another passage in the New Testament I found really helpful. It's in, in the letter of 2 Peter. And, and the letters that Peter writes to the New Testament church are really helpful because they come out of the context of suffering. I, I think Peter's churches would have recognized what's going on in Iraq and Syria today. They would have known what it meant to be persecuted um, and understand, understood there'd be an affinity between those brothers and sisters that maybe we couldn't share because we've just never been through it. And Peter writes from that context and into that context. 
And one of the, the fears and the, 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 the things that was troubling the church in the first century, towards the end of the first century, was where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? He said he was going to come back and, and come back and fix everything. You know, Hezekiah saw this incredible deliverance um, as King Sennacherib was, was assassinated and, and, and the military threat was, was neutralized. We see an even greater deliverance when Jesus returns, when everything is put right. But, but the question is, why, why does he wait? Why not now? And this is sort of pressing for us, isn't it, in our relative comfort, but it's hugely pressing for those who every day face persecution. And so the question was, was bouncing around. Why hasn't he come back? And Peter responds to this in chapter 3 of 2 Peter. So 2 Peter 3, um, I think we'll start reading from verse 4. And just listen to how Peter unpacks this, because people were longing for this kind of deliverance. They were praying. I imagine there were people similar to Hezekiah on their knees with, with nothing left to offer but a prayer. And, and Peter says this, chapter 3, verse 4. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. It's interesting how persecuted Christians often lean on the greatness and the bigness and the awesomeness of God. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. God judges. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything, sorry, um, and earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens and, uh, by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. See, Peter deals with this in greater depth in both of his letters, actually. But what he's saying here is God's timing can sometimes seem hard from our perspective. And this isn't a full answer to that. We couldn't give a full answer in the time we've, we've got this evening. But, but part of the reasoning seems that God is still holding out his hand of grace to many in this world. God, in a way, allows his church to go through difficult times in order to offer grace to those who aren't yet saved. There's an incredible uh, kind of paradoxical mercy at work here that means that sometimes for the church it is hard. Sometimes it is difficult, but at the same time, God is extending his love further and further into our world. But that hope is not destroyed by the fact that God's timing is difficult, that hope stands strong, that one day God will bring about a new heaven and a new earth, that one day when Jesus returns, we will be delivered. Just like in Hezekiah's day, there was a military deliverance. Right now, the things that we struggle with, the things that the persecuted church in in other parts of the world are wrestling with, will be delivered from them. Evil will cease, and the new creation will begin. And what is that creation like? It's the place where righteousness dwells. And so for us, it can be hard. It can be so, so hard. And for others, harder still. Uh, To live in a world where God's timing seems slow. But we can still trust him. And we can still pray to him because Jesus will return. And when he does, we will be delivered completely. In in the same way that Hezekiah uh, was restored in in the promised land in a little tiny way, we'll be restored in the great promised land of the new heavens and the new earth. In a moment, we're going to take communion. And we do that regularly at this church to remember that Jesus died and that his body was broken, his blood was shed. Um, But there's a little phrase that we don't always pick up on when it's described to us in in 1 Corinthians 11. It says that, that we do this until he comes. 
We, we remember the death um, of Jesus that was our victory, uh, that, that won the war, that gave us this deliverance. And we do it to remind ourselves of it in the present, hoping for the future when he returns, when that deliverance will be complete, and when the new heavens and the new earth comes. And when Jesus is Lord, and no one like Sennacherib or Isis or anyone else can stand opposed to him, when everyone recognizes that he is the king of all the kingdoms of the earth, and when he settles his people in their promised land and gives them life. That's what we hope for. And we're going to celebrate that in a moment. But let me pray for us first, and perhaps as I do, the band could come up. We're going to sing um, together in just a moment. Father, thank you that for us in our relative comfort, and even for the most hard-pressed believers around the world, we have a hope in Christ. Thank you that men like Hezekiah have have shown us what it means to trust in you in difficult times. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be more like him. Help us, when hard times come, to respond like he does, just like a reflex of prayer. Help us Father, to pray bigger, maturer prayers, prayers about your glory, prayers about the wider world, prayers about other people, not just about ourselves. And Father, while we wait, uh, while we long for the future, but know that it's not quite here yet, help us to keep trusting, uh, to keep remembering the victory of Christ that is decisive and it is finished until one day he returns. Lord, I pray that you'd make us people who stand by faith. And Lord, even though we don't experience the kind of persecution we see on the news today in Britain, Lord, we know that there's all possibility that that could come to us at some point in some of our lifetimes. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would prepare us and help us. Lord, even for the little persecution we experience now, the the difficulties of being a Christian in a post-Christian context, help us by your spirit to stand for you, to be faithful, to trust you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.